On June 26, 2015, the United States Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, declared it legal for same-sex couples to marry in all 50 states. On our podcast today, we speak with the first same-sex couple to marry after the court's decision, Petrina Bloodworth and Emma Folks, a same-sex couple living in Atlanta, Georgia. They talked about how Jeff Graham, executive director of Georgia Equality, an LGBT advocacy organization in Georgia, helped them initiate the process, what it was like to wait until they actually had the opportunity to marry and what married life looks like today. Welcome to the Zami Noble National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. My name is Emma Enola Folks St. Louis. I am the first generation American. How I move in this world to me, I feel like I'm a activist. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. I'm a good friend to the people that are my friends. And um, I think I'm one of the luckiest people on the planet. My name is Petrina Bloodworth. I am from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I've been in Atlanta for about 20 years. And I'm an auditor by day. I guess I'm, I'm a mom, a wife, a sister. Well, we are so glad to have you on the Zami Nobla podcast this afternoon. We're especially glad because you all are intimately tied to the organization with Emma being the board chair. We're also excited and glad to have you here because you all provided a very historic moment for the nation. And that is being the first same-sex couple to marry after the historic Supreme Court verdict. Tell us a little bit about how you led up to that moment and what that was like for you as a couple. So I, at the time, was the president or vice president. I believe I was the president of another organization, uh, LGBT organization in the city, and a journalist from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reached out to us to ask our opinion about same-sex marriage. He was doing a a kind of a pro-con piece. And in the interview, um, I mentioned that as soon as the Supreme Court ruled, if they ruled in our favor, we were going to um, go to REI and, and buy a tent and, you know, pitch a tent on the courthouse steps. But we were going to be one among the first. And it was a I said it jokingly. And Jeff Graham reached out to me and asked me if I was serious about wanting to be if we really wanted to be one of the first couples. And I said, you know, definitely. And so he told um, us to uh, sign up for the Supreme Court. um, I guess every day the Supreme Court, when they're in session and they're going to rule on stuff, they release what they're going to be ruling on that particular day. And they gave us rules. If we were going to be amongst the first, we had to be prepared. I believe it was on a Thursday. There were certain two, I can't remember the days, but there were two days when they would possibly rule and we had to be prepared to drop everything and be downtown at Fulton County Courthouse by 1 p.m. Yeah, we were signed up for text notifications. And so every day we got a text and it would say, no decision made today, tune back in tomorrow (laughs) for the decision. And so it was this anticipated waiting game. We thought one of the days for sure, I think was our actual anniversary, um, was I believe it was June 18th. And I just knew that, oh, my gosh, you know, God, (laughs) the gods, you know, the divine is going to make sure that this happens on this day. And it didn't. And I believe I cried that day, but it was because it was an emotional roller coaster. Even our parents wanted to be at the wedding and we had to tell them, no, you, you know, you you just can't come post up in our house and hang out with us until the Supreme Court rules. Um, We we don't know what when that day is going to be. And so when they didn't rule on I think it was the 18th uh, Judge Jane Morrison decided that um, she wanted people in her chambers on that Friday because the justices said that they would also be ruling on a Friday which was the what day did we get married? (laughs) The the 25th? She doesn't know either. It's 26? It's either 25 or 26. (laughs) I think it's 26. So (laughs) 
<laughs> whatever that date was, uh, it was on a Friday, but it was also the anniversary of a couple of historic things. And um, I didn't think it was going to happen because I didn't see the Supreme Court being particularly historic <laughs> or symbolic or, you know. Um, so we went to the judges chambers at we got there probably at eight in the morning and um, we had our son with us. And we had also went down to Florida to get married that spring, but didn't get married because our son was still in college. And we knew that he would be pretty upset if we had gotten married and he wasn't there. Uh, he was one of our biggest fans. And so the three of us went down to the courthouse. I didn't think it was happening. I don't think she even thought it was happening. We were both like, well, we'll be at work later on. I had meetings. She had meetings. <laughs> like, we just didn't see it happening because of all the up and down. And and then it happened. And then the rest is kind of history. Yeah. Bef- when when we got to the courthouse, we did a, a walkthrough, a, a run through of, well, if the decision is yes, then, you know, this is where you go, this is where you stand, then you'll go and talk to this person and that person. And so, yeah, we we did a a run through of of several things just in case. And shockingly, there weren't we there wasn't anybody else there. So the registration line or the line where you have to like file your form to get married, Mm -hmm. we left our son there. So he would hold our place. As number one. And so that number one, someone made just for him. And so he he stayed in that line or stayed in that room. And we went back to the judges chambers and waited. When did you know you were number one? There was a thing going on between Georgia and Austin. Yeah. There was some type of competition going on between Georgia and Austin and who was going to be the first. And I remember... Jeff Graham, you know, definitively saying they were the first in the country. And, you know, all of the reporters kept saying the first in Georgia. And then I think it was by the end of that weekend, we realized that it was the first number one in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, But by that point, we just didn't, I didn't, we didn't Mm -hmm. want to talk about it anymore. So it just (laughs) didn't matter. When you look back on that moment, how does it feel being the first in the country to be married as a same sex couple? Yeah, it's pretty monumental. Like, I look back and I think... Oh, wow. And thinking about all the phone calls we we received, uh, the Facebook messages that we didn't even know were there or how to access them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were, I think for both of us, we found messages a year later <laughs> that were on Facebook. That's because we are technologically... <laughs> <laughs> People offering to make our cake for free. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of that was yeah, we just didn't know and and some newscasters reaching out as well. Yeah, we were in all of the major uh news outlets. That that to me was is pretty cool because my you know, our grandkids and future mm-hmm. generations will see that. But for me, I don't know that it meant anything because I was upset at the fact that it didn't mean anything that it wasn't how do I say this so we weren't the ones who went to the Supreme Court and challenged the Supreme Court on the ruling Mm -hmm. we weren't the ones who you know fought about we you know we didn't spend money for that to happen that way we spent money in a lot of other ways you know campaign donations things like that my thing was Nathan Deal okay not you know not not a fan not, not you know not political I'm not a Democrat I'm not a Republican But when Nathan Deal said that he was not going to challenge whatever the Supreme Court ruling was and that he would accept it, that to me let me know that it was, oh, for me, it was staying in Georgia. Mm -hmm. That decision to me was monumental from the standpoint of that's where this is where my home is going to be. Because if Georgia did not allow or if they were going to fight same sex marriage, I was out of here. Mm -hmm. And I I was at the point where I was sick and tired of spending money, paying Mm -hmm. taxes and not being recognized. So. You know, for me, it was a whole lot of other stuff other than, you know, us getting married. I mean, we we were together for 10 years when that happened. So it was just kind of, I guess, finally. How did you first meet? I knew someone that threw lesbian parties and that I had attended for years. I want to give her a shout out. Hey, Shaitan, ladies at play. Um, it was a ladies at play party. And um, there wasn't a a set venue for it. Every month or every quarter, she would have parties at different uh, venues around town. 
And this particular night, it was at a restaurant that used to be called Cherry. On West Peachtree Street. On West Peachtree. Today, it is Steamhouse Lounge. Yeah, there's two sides to this story. There's two sides to this story. Mm -hmm. And my side is I was on a sabbatical. (laughs) I was taking a relationship sabbatical for about a year. And I was just trying to figure out, you know, doing some real soul searching about, you know, who I was. um, Was I gay? Was I bi? Was I lesbian? You know, who was I going to date? What was my life going to be like? And, you know, really just get serious. If I if I was going to be with someone, I had, had, you know, written a list of my non-negotiables, you know, what I wanted from this person, this next person I was going to be with. And I was very serious. And my friends heard about this ladies at play party. And I told them emphatically, I'm not going. I'm not going. Absolutely not. Not going. And they showed up at my house. They got me dressed and they pulled me to this party. And the whole time we were there, they kept asking, what do you like? Who do you like? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't know what I like. I don't have a type, but I'll know it when I see it. And they walked me around that bar, (laughs) around that place like two or three times. And on one of the last go rounds, she was standing opposite the bar up against the wall and I remember walking by going that's I saw her (laughs) that's what I like and we did a you know we ended up back on the other side and then she walked by and went to the restroom and I was like that's her right there and then you can tell from there (laughs) okay so uh, my my side is I was all for going out um, hanging out with friends and yeah, I, I remember the moment at the across from the bar. Really didn't see much that I liked that night. And when she passed by, I didn't I didn't get a good glimpse of her face, but from the back and her hair, I was like, hmm, I think she's cute. So I was waiting for her to come back by so that I could get a look. So when she came back by, I thought, okay, yeah, I like I like her. And I, I paid attention to where she went in, in, the, in the club and purposely went to the restroom so that I could get closer to where she was. So after I came from the restroom, I, of course, I, I saw her. I knew where, where she was. And at the time, she was dancing with one of her friends. So I told my friend, let's dance next to him Mm -hmm. because I'm going to talk to her and before I got the chance to come around and talk I guess she had told her friend there she is and her friend was like here y'all switch I did nothing of the sort everybody did everything else for me so I had no game I didn't even want to be there I'd never had to talk to a woman before in my life so The person that was with us said, let's switch y'all two dance. We danced. So (laughs) the friend I was with wanted her beer and was like, okay, uh, she wants your number. And I was like, how do I know she wants my number? She didn't ask me for my number. And I should not have my head. And she was like, yeah, I do want your number. So she gave me her number and I still have it. (laughs) Wow. The, The black writing is now kind of a brownish color. But I still have the writing with her name on it. And oh, I remember very sentimental. Yeah, I remember getting in the car with my friends going, what am I supposed to do now? Mm-hmm. And um, one friend said, you know, you wait two days and then you call her. I said, two, <laughs> two, 48 hours. Oh, my goodness. How do you pronounce her name? I've never seen that name before. Blah, 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 blah. And so we started talking. It was a little interesting in the beginning. Yeah. Um, very interesting in the beat. We're totally two totally different people mm-hmm. now than we were mm-hmm. when we met. We were at our rawest, yeah. <laughs> honoriest, uh just no, we were the baddest thing on the face of the planet. Yeah. And to this day her friend will will take credit and go, I made this. I did this. You know, I let her run with it for a while, but I go, you know what? No. I was there because I was coming for you. I went after you. I placed myself in that situation because I was coming for you. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it sounds very interesting because the way in which we show up in our professional lives is not necessarily the way we show up in our personal lives. 
It's important to know these stories, though, because one of the things I think we don't have a wealth of in the LGBT community is how um, women successfully come together as a couple and marry and create a life together. And so having an opportunity to talk to you all about the joys and challenges and opportunities for relationships is very important. What do you think has changed the most about your being together and and now being married over the past, what is it now? You've been together 12 years? 13. 13 years. I think we've both uh, definitely grown as people. Um, Like Emma said earlier, we're not the same people that we were. Uh, We were probably a little more hot-headed firecrackers and I think some of the challenges we faced though early on were I had a I have a had a teenage son mm-hmm. and she wasn't used to dating people with kids mm-hmm. and I you know coming from a background where I had a step parent and it wasn't a good relationship wanted to shield my son away from that and so I I took very uh careful measures where I would have loved for her to have lived. If it was just me and her, Mm -hmm. we would have probably moved in together after about three years, maybe four. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But with him being there, I wanted to make sure that um, her number one, not having been around kids and boys are a little bit different, Mm -hmm. you know, and my style of parenting, my family's style of parenting, as we just realized, it's not just me. My mother did it too, but our style of parenting is a little bit different. It's non-traditional And so there are things that I did in raising him that she wasn't accustomed to. And so I knew right off the the bat that that was going to cause some strife and it it was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of time for him to go. He's not, you know, with me forever. It was a moment of time. And we kind of started talking about what we were going to do and weren't going to do and when we were going to move in together. And I wanted him to get out through out of high school and then we could live our lives. But I wanted to give him as, you know, as least the least amount of disruptions because of things that I had gone through with my previous exes. I felt mm-hmm. that I had done enough. Um, he had seen enough that I think was the biggest thing. And then we're just so independent, mm-hmm. you know, usually like people are always trying to figure us out mm-hmm. and I'll tell you now, you're not going to, you're not going to figure anything out. Who's the most masculine. Who's the most aggressive. You go on and do, you take bets. We'll take those mm-hmm. bets. <laughs> we'll take those bets. You gonna lose your money. Go, who's the boy and who's the girl. Like we we're both women. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, because the two of us are so independent, um, it did cause problems because we don't know to let the other person help out. And so mm. some of the issues that we had was because the other person is just simply trying to help out. And we're both very independent and headstrong and I don't need anybody and I can do this on my own. And it's not, uh, you know, realizing that it's not about needing. It's about somebody is your partner and it's just... This is how families interact. And so mm-hmm. the dynamics of our relationship, the, the two of us and then the three of us, it just kind of happened, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I realized even with my son that he had gotten attached to her way before I realized it. You know, she and I had had in our early hot headed days <laughs> uh, a civil disagreement and she left our house. And I remember my son looking at me and explaining to me that the things that I say affect more than just me affects other people and he walked out of the house and he got in the car with her wow and i remember thinking huh he's not loyal (laughs) (laughs) he's not loyal i hate him right now (laughs) but it did it showed me that he you know loved her enough to like walk out on his mother and to tell me that whatever it was that I said at the time was wrong or I don't even remember what what was going on. Mm-hmm. All I remember is he just walked out of the house mm-hmm. to go get in the car with Petrina. Mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. So and that that showed me that, OK, this is a family and I need to start treating us as such, even though we don't always we're not always living in the same house. But um, we started planning our goals together mm-hmm. um, end of the year. Um, we would plan our goals and everybody had to tell what their goals were. Cause if you don't tell about, talk about your goals, you're not accomplishing them. So we, there were things that we all started doing together as a family, um, going on vacations together, um, going to the movies together, uh, Deuce Bigelow, European gigolo oh, was one of the movies gosh. that will forever be etched in our brains. Yes. We, we had no idea what to expect with that movie. And we took, and him. we took him. And he was just enjoying it. 
loved it. I think he was enjoying it even more because we were so uncomfortable. And we were mortified. It was one of those times I wanted to walk out and just leave. (laughs) Just like, what did I do? I'm usually pretty good at that. And then I started realizing between the two of them, there was a connection with them. Mm. So the fact that the two of them would start laughing or making fun of something or like they have a lot of similarities Mm -hmm. in the the things that they like from a comedy's perspective. You know, they like that darker humor or that slap. They're okay with that slapstick. They can watch people jump off of a, you know, something with their bike and crash. And the two of them will think it's funny. Mm -hmm. I am, you know, it, that bothers me. They can watch the scary. And so there's a lot of stuff that they started doing together The connection was more than just a biological thing. Mm -hmm. It was more than just a DNA thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, even to the two of them have problems on the same day. Mm. So there's something about the two of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's an auditor in in that accountancy world. Mm -hmm. And my son is an accountant, a staff accountant. Mm. And so he calls what me emo mom or emo. I'm the emotional. She's emo mom and bio mom. And that's mom. (laughs) Mom. Mom. And then our families made it so easy. So there was, Mm. we didn't have a lot of the issues that a lot of people have because her family accepted me once they realized I was sticking around. Mm -hmm. And I think I may have been the first person she brought home in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, Her family, once they realized, okay, because she had to kind of sort of come out to them, but they knew Um, they were cool with it. My mom, once my mom, as soon as my mother met her, my mom was in love with her. And her words are, she's kick ass. <laughs> like she, she's kick ass. She can kick your ass. <laughs> so, so, you know, my family loved her. Her family loved me. So a lot of the, the issues that couples have, uh, the external issues, we just didn't have those. Our external issues were work and finally being comfortable at a certain point to stop speaking in pronouns or to make up stories about what we did for the weekend. Hmm. I think we did that around the same time also. In 2008, we put our foot down. We put our feet down. Mm. Not doing this anymore. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And we just started living in, you know, this is who we are. And what are you going to say? Did you find that you had problems in your workplace because of that? Um, I was in a very, we were were both in very conservative industries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, white male uh, and just conservative, Mm -hmm. period. Well, I... For me, when I started to just say, you know what, the next job I go to, I'm just living all the way out. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm tired of doing this pronoun game. It takes too much to try and remember, too, what you said or what name Mm -hmm. you associated with whatever. So I I happened to go work for a media broadcasting company. There's all types of personalities there. Mm -hmm. All types of people, personalities, yeah, everything. And so that I think that made it a little bit more comfortable for me to be myself because I knew that they're used to seeing different uh, personalities because they have uh, DJs and they they interview celebrities on their radio shows. So I'm, I'm in corporate America, but it's still uh, less conservative mm-hmm. uh, in that respect. And once I uh, just started saying you know, my partner at the time and with conviction, not like trying to ask for permission or sound hesitant. Like, yeah, my partner, like it's no big deal. And if you don't act like it's a big deal, then it's not really, people don't focus on that. One of the things that I think is so wonderful again, is not just having you present as a couple, but even that whole aspect of a family, because It's important that we think about families in very different ways and the way in which you talk about your son and that poignant story about how he got in the car with you, Petrina, is like something you always want to remember because it really shows how people bond together. And I think that's a beautiful thing and we need more stories around that, more images and and visions of how people come together as a couple. I'm curious if your son was here today what would he say about the two of you? How would he describe your relationship? Therapy alert. <laughs> That's how he describes our relationship. <laughs> and what exactly yeah. does that mean? <laughs> oh, they're kissing again. Oh, they're touching again. Oh, there they go. Oh, I don't want to hear this. I think there's even, there's a picture online that some photographer caught when we got married and we kissed and his face 
was like just contorted because (laughs) just oh there they go again yeah um one of the things we had to do with him early on though is we asked him to keep our relationship a secret Mm. and i'm thinking about the phone call from school uh, we asked him to keep our relationship a secret because he was in middle school going into high school and and he was getting into a lot of fights. You know, it was just normal kid stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, one of the things I didn't want to do was for him to, because he's very protective of me, mm-hmm. I didn't want him to hear somebody say dyke this or lesbian this or whatever, whatever derogatory mm-hmm. thing someone would come up with. Mm-hmm. And him now feel like he has to fight because somebody disrespected his mama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So I made it a point and I told him, you need to keep this secret. Well, one of his English teachers had them read a book and it had to deal with the Holocaust and the uh, pink triangles and you know, yeah, the pink triangles, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And I guess he lit the class up and stood up and says he had gay people in his family and, and lit them, everybody a new, you know, you know what? And the teacher called me and she said, you know, um, I don't know if you know this, but Ramius, you know, yada, yada, yada. And just explain, you know, express what he had said. And I said, well, yes, he does have people in his family that are gay and I'll talk to him. But if he feels that people are being, um, you know, bigoted or et cetera, he's going to speak his mind. And that's what he did. And, you know, I did have a conversation with him. We had even invited that teacher over and he, he gave her a talking to, we had invited her over to watch a fight. And he said, you know, Hey, these are my, my, you know, my mother and, and, and her girlfriend and what happens in our house doesn't leave our house. <laughs> wow. But he didn't know his teacher was gay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I never, t- I still haven't told him. <laughs> I, I thought he, uh, no, he doesn't know. Wow. He doesn't know. So, uh, know when he hears this. Well, yeah. How did you all know that the teacher was gay? Well, I had had a, when I, when we had the phone call, I told her. Okay. I, and then she I came out her, to she, you. Yeah. Yeah. I told okay. her, I said, well, you know, we kept talking and I, I always gauge, um, I always gauge where I take conversations based on the responses that I get back from people. Yeah. I know that you all are a big um, movers and shakers in your field and doing some really exciting work. We mentioned, Emma, that you are the board chair of ZAMI Nobla, the National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging. And Petrina, I hear that you are the board chair of the Atlanta LGBT Chamber of Commerce? Uh, Vice president. Vice president. So next year I will be president. And how long have you been in that position? Um, I started out as treasurer in 2017. And then I was tapped. Uh, the incoming president asked me to be her vice president. Mm-hmm. So I started, that transition happened in May of this year. And so it's a three-year commitment. Okay. Once you're tapped to be vice president, then you will be president the next year. And then uh, immediate past president, uh, which is like a consultant role to the new president. We know why Zami Nobla is such an important organization. Uh, tell me a little bit more, uh, Petrina, about uh, the importance of the LGBT Chamber of Commerce and, and what you all do. Um, the Atlanta Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce exists to uh, promote economic empowerment for uh, LGBTQ plus business owners. Uh, we provide a lot of programming to uh, further education for business owners. Uh, We offer uh, networking events, different types of programming. Uh, Like uh, last year, we started a LGBTQ summit Mm. where we invited some of the mayoral candidates to sit and and that was interesting. I thought mm-hmm. there was going to be a fight on the stage. Wow. There were nine candidates there. It was wow, very, very good. Very wow. well done. And now we have Mayor Keisha. <laughs> yes. She was there. Yeah, she was there. She was there. Uh, we try and have a lot of good programming for our business owners and, and you know, help them be successful. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things, and, you know, I'm going to, I'm, since I'm past president. Yeah, yeah, Emma's a past yeah, I'm president. Past president. Oh, wow. So uh, the first woman of color or person of color, and she's second woman of color and wow. just happens to be married to me. You keep it in the family. Keep it in the family, right? <laughs> but is the LGBT BE certification. So one of the things that I think that business owners and, and the AGLCC do a really great job of is certifying if you're a member of that chamber, 
you get um, um, you get certified you can get certified for free mm -hmm. and that certification is important when you're looking at bidding on contracts and things like that it's mm -hmm. another box for people to check so just like you have the women you know women owned business minority owned business veteran owned business etc now they have the lgbt be and the be stands for business enterprise mm. and that one is phenomenal because a lot of um companies are looking to you know they have a a requirement to do have a spend and one of the coolest things was during the uh barack obama uh, administration he told the small business administration to start doing more with the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And it was literally like one day we got a call from the SBA that, Hey, uh, we were told we need to talk to you guys. And, you know, we signed a letter of uh what's the SAM something mem memorandum, you know, they have all those acronyms and we did a big to do at the Fox theater. So, and I think how many LGBT BEs do we have? Six, five, I don't know the numbers, um... but I don't have the number, but right we're pretty on. high up in the we're country. Pretty, right? Wow! Yeah, uh, we just had our national conference mm -hmm. in Philly back in August, and of all the chambers across the nation, I remember thinking we're either number one or two with the number of certified businesses that wow. we have. Oh, that's wonderful! Yeah. yeah, and then they're also helping out with the NFL. The NFL is going to be here for the Super Bowl, and so the NFL has purposely reached out to the AGLCC to ask like, Hey, we need some LGBT businesses to, to use as vendors. And so I think that the chamber is helping bring a lot of pink dollars, help, helping get uh, pink dollars. <laughs> yeah. And, and we also added a tourism uh, pillar to our, to our initiatives to uh, help promote Atlanta as a gay friendly destination. Wow. So you all do a lot of great work. Proud to be a part of it. So you have your civic obligations and your professionals with very busy lives. How do you keep it together? What's the uh, the secret of um, you all being able to have balance and uh, stay connected with each other? Massages. Uh, definitely massages. So everybody has a, a vice mm -hmm. and we eat healthy. We don't drink a lot. You know, we may drink wine, mm -hmm. but we don't really drink a lot. We don't smoke. Mm -hmm. We don't do a lot of things. So our vice is watching Ratchet TV. Okay. Yes. And so for us, we get really excited to be able to come home. And no matter what, it's, it's you know, we're sending each other texts. It's almost eight o'clock. Where are you? <laughs> it's time to watch Ratchet TV. And so that's kind of our release. And we end up talking and... So we, we talk a lot and thankfully we both have the ability to work from home sometimes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so because of that, we can both be at the, you know, dining room table or in the living room with our laptops, which is not ideal, but it's, it's our ideal world mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really nice uh, combination for the both of you, the work that you're doing. It's just wonderful to have women like you in leadership in Atlanta doing some fabulous things with some great organizations. I know there may be some listeners who are at the point of having heard this interview and they're excited about just possibilities. And I'd like to leave people with something to think about from the interview. And so we've talked a lot about just the, the history of you all being the first couple in the nation after the Supreme Court verdict to marry. And that's huge. That's the, the big thing. But I think the, the miracle really is people working together and staying together as a couple. You know, that's the um, the thing that to me is important as I think about my own relationship and other people's relationships. It's the day-to-day -day practice of getting up in the morning and being committed to the person you love and the person who makes the home for you. Um, so there may be someone out there who's thinking about um, just the, the, the joys and the challenges of finding the right person and having the type of relationship where they can um, be present in the world as you all are present. What would you say to, to that individual? Well, I would say sometimes I, I think it, people may look at us and think that, you know, it looks like it's perfect or I want that. And they, like, they have this, you know, pe it's like people watching like Disney movies, like everything, they're going to find their Prince Charming or their princess and everything's perfect. But, you know, everything, everything takes work and you have to be willing to, you know, work on yourself. And it's about communication 
and and those are things you know and things aren't nobody's perfect so your relationship isn't going to be perfect um but if you know if you keep in mind you know if you love the person you're with then you know anything can be talked through and and Mm -hmm. worked out the third year of our relationship was a real hard one um year three was really really difficult for us and we were at a crossroads um you know, one foot in the door, one foot out of the door. And, you know, this this relationship was, was different. It was my first semblance of a healthy relationship. And mm-hmm. when we started arguing a lot or what, and, and granted, I, she's a, I'm a Gemini. You made fun of that. She's a Scorpio. Okay. <laughs> so when you, when you take those two and two people that are not going to give, you know, you're going to have some issues. So we went to therapy. And even to this day, if, if we start arguing, because we don't, we don't cheat on each other and we don't mess with each other's money. So there really aren't too many other things that you really have to be angry about. And I mean, just that, you know, and we don't do things to intentionally hurt each other or push each other's buttons. So we have, you know, there's rules. And anytime our communications break down, we go back to therapy. Um, Because now our inner childs are (laughs) our inner children are out Mm -hmm. speaking and we both have, you know, stories of, you know, childhood stuff that that, you know, resurface from time to time. But we use therapy and then we yeah, we and yeah, I think that a lot of people uh, are afraid to go to admit that maybe they need to go to therapy or even give it a try. And, you know, they continue this cycle of of you know, going through relationship after relationship instead of, uh, I think people may think that, you know, it's gotten a stereotype that maybe you're crazy or, Mm -hmm. or maybe there's something wrong with you if you go to a therapist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, going back to nobody's perfect. We all have, uh, issues that from childhood that shaped who we are today and and sometimes we we need a, a unbiased opinion to to help us through. And mm-hmm. neither of us grew up seeing a couple in a healthy relationship. Mm. So when you look at people who you know what is our template? Mm-hmm. What do we have? And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that we talked about. I don't know how two people are supposed to behave in a home, mm-hmm. um, he- in a healthy way. So we and which is I think is so cool is our son wants what we have. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He wants exactly what we have in a relationship. And that told me, tells us like every time he says something like that, we're like, Oh yes, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, we're, we don't do it in front of him, but mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we did it. But one of the things that I think is very important, at least for me, it's not being right. You know, she's a, she has to be right. And I'm okay with that. That's her personality for me saying, sorry, I don't care. We're angry at each other. Fine. I did it. I'm sorry. Whatever. I just don't want to fight with you anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it's not important. Mm-hmm. Her thing is, you know, are you, is, is what you're saying or doing right now adding value mm-hmm. to our relationship? Mm-hmm. <laughs> are you adding value right now? <laughs> right. So, um, so we have kind of a checks and balances system. And then our families <laughs> also have heard us interact with each other. And so they'll start chiming in with the little you know, are you adding value or why are you mm-hmm. doing this? Or why are you saying this? You know, she doesn't like this. You know, she doesn't like that. So it, it's, it's a pretty weird dynamic. But if I were to tell Petrina that there's something that she's doing that upsets me, Petrina will do everything in her power not to do that anymore mm-hmm. and vice versa. And mm-hmm. that's where, that's why we've been able to grow mm-hmm. um, is because we've decided that we want to be, we want to be in this relationship more than we want to be out of it. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that there's anybody out there Mm-hmm. that I want to be with mm-hmm. um, other than, than, than this. And I don't care how much she gets on my nerves. <laughs> I don't care how much <laughs> I get on her nerves. Cause I know that I do, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not an easy person to deal with. Neither one of us are easy people. Mm-hmm. Right. But we love each other so much that whatever it's going to take to make sure that we can be okay together is what we're going to, we're going to do whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. And, and we're all in, we have rules of engagement. We have rules of, you know, timeouts when we're angry at each other. We don't always adhere to it, but you know, we, we've got rules when for the most part we've, we, we've got rules and, and you know, we stick to it. And then the other thing is we don't tell other people when we fight, when we first got together, there were certain rules that we, we called it a manual. It's a fictitious manual that we have. 
and we've got it <laughs> page numbered. So on page number 18, it says, don't tell anybody about our arguments. Mm. And if we can do that, if our relationship is just our relationship, mm-hmm. can, we can fix it. Mm-hmm. But once you start putting other people into our situation, so we, if we do ask other people for advice, it's usually people who are in healthy relationships. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've kind of, you know, carved our relationship uh, and, and left it to us. We don't talk about our relationship on Facebook. If you mm-hmm. look at my Facebook status, I think it says single still. Cause I've never updated, <laughs> you know, and even when Facebook came out, I said, Hey, you know, we started seeing what other people were doing. Hey, we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, not mm-hmm. no complicated. No, how, if we're arguing, yeah. you better not, <laughs> you better not check that box. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've changed mine. Yeah. I think you're still it's single probably and looking. still the same. <laughs> Is there anything we've left unsaid? Is there anything you want to share with our listeners before we close this episode? Well, I think what I would want to share with people is that no matter what your background is, you know, I'm, I mentioned I was first generation. So my father's Haitian and he accepts us. My mother's Costa Rican and she accepts us. My mother's family is from Jamaica and most of my Jamaican relatives accept us. And I would say give your family a chance. Um, Even if they're extremely religious, some people love their family more than they love a religion or a book. That's what I would say is is Mm. give them a chance because I hid from my family for many years. Mm. Yeah, and I I hid from mine for a while. Um, But my mother has always, you know, been the type to say, I'm going to love you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Uh, even, Even when I told her, she's like, I don't, care i'm still gonna love you Mm -hmm. um so yeah that that made it easier i still love you too (laughs) ditto well i just want to thank you both for adding value to the zami nola (laughs) podcast we have so enjoyed spending time with you today thank you and we thank you for being a part of our black lesbian herstory thank you and thank thank you you for what you're doing i love these thank you thank you What a fun and informative interview. We are so grateful to Petrina and Emma for sharing their story with us and their continued commitment to LGBT rights in Georgia and across the country. If you want to know a little bit more about what that day was like, check out the links in our show notes. As always, we so appreciate your being part of our listening audience, and I hope we've added value to your day. Feel free to leave feedback or comments. If you'd like to email me directly, you may do so by contacting me at podcast at org. And until next time, have a sweet one. Hey.